الشيطاني الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Apologies for being late. I have been traveling, as you've heard, um, but it's always a pleasure to be here. The topic today is for us to discuss the concept of insanity. And we wanted to speak about this as, although some of you may not have attended the previous series of talks that I've discussed here, including discussing the nature of depression, of anxiety, of psychosis, of addiction, and other mental illnesses. The concept of insanity itself is often misunderstood. <clears throat> One of the things that we've stressed in the previous talks is our need, not simply in medical talks or uh, talks about psychiatry, but in all topics that we face in life, to try and merge our understanding of knowledge, whether it comes from uh, a so-called Islamic point of view, and I say so-called in the sense that we sometimes limit our knowledge that is Islamic from that, that which we read directly from the Quran. But we know that the Prophet Sallallahu made dua for an increase in knowledge which is beneficial. So the knowledge that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives mankind over the years that is in keeping with the Quran and the Sunnah is, as far as I'm concerned, Islamic as well. And so we want to look at the guidance that we're given from the uh, holy books uh, that have been revealed to us and from the um, acts and statements of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that are authentic. But then also to see how we can incorporate those into our lives based on other knowledge that has come to us. Now, People will know of the narrations from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, where it is said that the pen is lifted as in bad deeds are not going to be recorded from someone who uh, has lost their, their senses, that is insane, until they come back to their senses. But what does insanity mean? How does the law view insanity? What is this Islamic guidance telling us? What do, how do we deal with it? And how do we face it? And where possible, how do we, in circumstances when we can avoid it, how can we avoid it? Another issue that came to my mind when discussing this is that we know that as Muslims, we should not go to a judge, any judge, when we know we are in the wrong, hoping to get a judgment that's going to be in favor of us. And I say this because, although it may not be common, in some cases I see in my practice as a psychiatrist, some people may claim that their difficulties, which are occasioning some form of mental illness, mean that they are totally absolved from responsibility from whatever they do. Now, it may be the case that suffering from a certain illness may wear this to a certain degree, briefly or otherwise absolve you from actions, but it is not a permanent get out of jail card. And as we said, we wouldn't go to a judge to try and get a judgment in our favor. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of judges, but he's also all-knowing and all-seeing. And we cannot lie to him, and we should not lie to ourselves. So, the next step, I suppose, is to ask ourselves, how will we, we decide that somebody who's done an act is not responsible for that? The way in which the law breaks it down here is to look at the person's capacity. In Latin they call it the, the mens re. So you're looking to see what was in the mind of the person at the time of the act. And you would look at several things. You would look at the person's ability to understand uh, what was going on or the information given to them. Uh, to a degree their ability to remember it and their ability to weigh in the balance the nature and consequences of the act that they're going to do. So if, for example, somebody had an epileptic seizure 
and in the, in the time of that epileptic seizure, they uh, were flailing around and they hit somebody in error, temporarily they certainly wouldn't have been in their senses at the time. If somebody was hearing things or seeing things and they believed that somebody was trying to harm them and they acted in self-defense, then briefly for that act they may not be responsible. But simply because one is low in mood does not necessarily mean that committing suicide is okay. So we know that suicide is a great sin and we know that um, even if one, let's say, suffering from cancer or other illness, that one is not supposed to uh, consciously and volitionally take one's own life. And it certainly may be the case that for some people they may have such an extreme level of depression or other illness that temporarily they don't know what they are doing. And if they do something wrong when they do not know what they are doing, and only Allah knows the, the truth of that, then perhaps their act will be absolved. But where we fall into feeling low and hopeless, and we then decide that because I do not think things are going to get better, I am going to act to end things, then we know what we're doing, we know what our <coughs> act is, and we're doing something consciously, and that is something we want to avoid. So, so moving beyond the legal aspect, let's ask ourselves how it is that people sometimes land in this position. Now, of course, in many cases, whether somebody has a brief epileptic seizure or they suffer from schizophrenia, as we've discussed before, and the psychosis, and they're hearing things and seeing visions, and they believe, believe in, in, in false things, then of course for them, in that certain uh, situation, the pen is certainly lifted from them. But we also know that depression, and even the opposite of depression when we discuss mood disorders, a manic episode where somebody is disinhibited, full of energy, running around, maybe even wanting to take their clothes off, they're very uh, elated and disinhibited. And we know that those diseases can be certainly biological. It can be, uh, you can have a predisposition inherited from your parents and it may come uh, out of the blue with no, with no uh, warning. But in other cases, these illnesses are defense. So the depression or the mania is a defense against the troubles of the world. That the troubles of the world are so overwhelming to us that we feel that we crumble and our mind unravels briefly or for a longer period of time, and we fall into this deep, uh, low mood or this manic episode. But as Muslims, we see the world not in two dimensions, but in, in more dimensions. We have time, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created time, He knows what's going to happen even on the Day of Judgment and in the Qur'an. We see narrations of people from the future, from the Day of Judgment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows what people are going to say. And we also know that there is an akhirah, that there is a hereafter. And, and so, if we're looking at life in a two-dimensional way, and we think that we are the person who needs to hold up the world and hold up all of these difficulties that our families are going through, and we are the ones who are solely responsible for providing for our family, and we are the ones that are solely responsible for the health of our children, or we are the ones that are solely responsible for the safety of our family, then it is reasonable that at some stage we're going to crack under that pressure and in some cases uh, our minds are going to break so that we go into this defense of depression or mania, for example. Or, uh, as we discussed with anxiety, our belief that we are in control and responsible will mean that we will be terrified of our child um, uh, crossing the street, terrified of our child, being dirty, terrified of our child, falling ill. And then we're going to have uh, fears which are disproportionate, and they're disproportionate because our belief that we can be so powerful and responsible is wrong. Only Allah can truly protect us, and if we understand that, then we know that we need to do what we can do, uh, and simply try to be the agent of good, but leave the results with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yesterday, uh, the last two days when I've been flying back from South Africa, I was reading uh, the New York Times uh, on one of the flights, and I saw that there was an article from uh, a reporter who was from India, and her husband was white American, and she was talking about, although she had grown up in India, she'd been raised really in Brooklyn. And as a parent in Brooklyn, she'd become quite... Uh, 
worried about every aspect of her child's health. She had an app on her phone as to when to feed her child. She'd worry about uh, exclusively breastfeeding or importing organic uh, baby food. And she really became uh, obsessed with every small uh, part of her child's life. Uh, and, it, and it was overwhelming to her. When she went to India on holiday and she showed her grandmother the app on her phone for feeding her child, thinking that her grandmother would, would be pleased and think that or wish she had something when she was younger, her grandmother laughed in her face. And when she was in India, you know, with the, with the dirt and the worry about uh, disease, she realized that she had to let go. She couldn't be worried about everything in her child's life. Uh, she had to accept that there was only certain things she could do uh, and that she had to, to leave the results uh, to themselves. And so unless we're able to adopt that uh, Islamic understanding that ultimately Allah is in charge and that we can only do our best and leave the results to Him, then it is more likely that we're going to uh, end up with such uh, excruciating fear and worry uh, and concern uh, and responsibility that we're going to crumble uh, under that uh, and, and, and potentially lead to an episode of mental illness where our mind unravels and we are regarded, even if briefly, uh, as having lost uh, our senses. And in this way, we can see that uh, if we gently look at it, um, a judge in this country might regard somebody who is drunk as not having control of their senses and regard anything they do while they're drunk as having diminished capacity. Now as Muslims, inshallah, we wouldn't drink at all. But we should also ask ourselves whether or not we have a responsibility to try and adopt an outlook in our life towards this world so that we don't end up not intoxicated with alcohol and so losing our senses there, but we don't end up believing that we are in control, we are responsible, we must do everything, we are the ones responsible for our child's health and for the safety of our family so that we end up with such uh, a severe uh, episode of low mood or manic mood or anxiety that we briefly crumble. And that rather, although with the people who do have those episodes we understand that in many cases it can be no fault of their own, but looking at ourselves we want to make sure that we are doing what we can do so that we don't end up with such episodes which are a result of our false outlook on the world. Because the modern society is very individualistic, it's all about me, but it's also very arrogant in the sense that we believe that we are the ones responsible. If we do the right thing, our children will be healthy. If we work hard, we will, have, we will be wealthy. If we do this, X will happen. It's very cause and effect in a very linear and two-dimensional way. And we know that it is risk comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course we have a responsibility to do all we can do, but we can't be responsible absolutely for the outcome. And if we feel that we are absolutely responsible for the outcome, we are putting us in the position that belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, just as you would avoid alcohol, we also want to avoid this uh, mistaken arrogance of the way in which we face life so that we don't fall into a, a place where the only route for us to try and uh, deal with those pressures is to briefly become insane, to briefly withdraw from the world because we, we can't handle it uh, and we simply want to withdraw and, and go to a place where, where we're not responsible. Because if you become insane, you are now a sick person, you are in the sick role, you have fewer duties and responsibilities and you are entitled to be cared for. And this is not to say, of course, we say that many people who fall into a period of insanity, it can be out of the blue, it could be a genetic predisposition, it could be a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has nothing to do with anything wrong that they do. So we're not, absolutely not, uh, casting blame in a generalized fashion. We're looking at ourselves and asking ourselves, what can we do to make sure that we are you know, tying our, our camel, that we, yes, we're trusting in Allah, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we are starting with good intentions and doing all the things that we should be doing in our life before responding to Him. And in this way we see that in Islam it's not simply about doing the rituals of the Salah, of the Zakat, of the Hajj, but it's also about the, the way in which we look at the world. What are we doing to look at the world? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the kafirun, about the people who reject faith, that they have, you know, eventually for those people whose hearts are blackened, they can have veils over their eyes and seals on their hearts and their ears may be closed. 
So we want to open our eyes and open our ears and unblock our hearts so that we are trying to face this world with taqwa, with consciousness of God, with consciousness of Allah, so that in the things that we do, we are humble enough that the good things that happen to us, we uh, taste the sweetness of it, but, but we don't gloat, we don't say that this is because of me. So that in the bad days, when bad things happen to us, we also don't crumble and say, this was all because of me, and then we fall apart. And, and so this helps us to, to see that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to ponder and reflect in the Qur'an. And we're trying to not simply uh, have good intentions and do the, the, the individual deeds that we know are farad and the individual deeds that, that may be voluntary, but we're trying to have what the Sahabas had. We want to have not simply uh, great knowledge of coming to talks, of knowing Bukhari, of knowing the Qur'an, and, and those are, are, are beautiful things, but to have a deep faith as the, that great generation had, where we have the Qur'an, we have the criterion of right and wrong within us, where we're able to navigate ourselves through this life, where we're able to know what direction to point ourselves in, whether we are in a, a war situation with bombs falling on our family's heads, or in a time of peace and plenty here, that we're able to accurately uh, be humble and grateful for the good things and accurately have uh, sabr in the difficult situations. And therefore, the things that happen to us don't cause us to crumble. Because not everybody in a war zone gets post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's not that the people who get PTSD are in the wrong, we're not saying that. But we are saying that one can protect oneself to a degree from post-traumatic stress in difficult situations if one acknowledges that even this terrible, unbelievably terrible thing that may have happened to us was with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and our job in that situation is try to have sabr, to be patient, to persevere, and to have resolve, and to keep going. And remember that all things come from Him, and that, that there's no power or might but from Allah. So it's not about what happens to us, but how we face it, and how we go forward uh, through the, the good things and the bad things uh, that happen in our life. And then when we look at it, not simply from our own individual point of view, but at someone else, a, a close family member or a friend, who has a period of insanity, of a, a, an extreme situation where they're clearly not in control of their senses, we need to ask ourselves how we, we face them and how we deal with them and if the worst happens to them and they do pass away, how we regard what has happened. And in many cases I see uh, people cast judgment with imperfect knowledge. And truly in these circumstances it only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has perfect knowledge. So to say to about that person that he or she did A, B and C and therefore they're in that situation and it's their fault, or even worse to blame some relative for cursing them and saying it's their fault, uh, or on the other hand, where somebody you know, relatively clearly does something wrong and ends up in a difficult situation uh, and for us to just explain it all away, are both uh, judgments which are imperfect. So instead, again, we realize that uh, these tests come from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and our test in dealing with that person might be to try and give them the message when they have their senses. Uh, and to try and uh, be merciful towards and supportive of them as well as we can. And this reminds of the uh, story which we discussed when we spoke about addiction, about when Umar radiallahu an was the uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, where there was a, a man who was repeatedly uh, drunk. And <coughs> he asked the, the gathering uh, that he was in to, to make du'a for this person, but he also wrote him a letter. But he, importantly, he asked the messenger, only to give this person the message, the letter, when the person was no longer drunk. Because you can only give the person a message when they come to their senses. Uh, and, and so we need to act with wisdom uh, and care uh, and love towards somebody who's in that difficult situation. And even if they're doing something of their own volition, which is causing uh, that difficulty, in this case it was alcohol, uh, or if somebody is deliberately not following advice in, and landing in a difficult situation repeatedly. It may be that they are wrong, but we don't write them off. We try and give them the good message when they have their senses, 
make dua for them, remind them that Allah is both most merciful and they should never lose hope of turning back to Allah, but also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment is severe. So that if they are doing something wrong, that they're not um, uh, dismissive of their own responsibility to try and, and turn back to the right path at some stage. Now, in the law in the UK, interestingly, the insanity defense is something that lawyers will often not want their clients to, to take because it is usually the case that if you are uh, absolved of the crime on the basis of insanity, you get locked up in a psychiatric hospital. But it is more difficult to get out of the psychiatric hospital than it is to get out of prison. So in the news today, yesterday, there's a story of this man who had uh, a male protect us all who had committed sexual assaults on many, many women and he's been released uh, after spending less than 10 years in prison and people are asking how the parole board came up to that decision. And that's not our concern today. But to say that that person, because he was given a sentence by a judge of eight years and he served that sentence in jail, he's going to be released from jail and the, the probation officers will have to watch him as best they can. But if he had assaulted even one woman and he had claimed the insanity defense, and he had gone to a psychiatric hospital, he would not have been able to be released from the psychiatric hospital until not only the psychiatrist, but a judge was convinced that he would never do the thing again. And that's a much, much higher bar. So obviously it's far more difficult to get out of. Now in Islam, we are really not that strict in the sense that if it is accepted that you were not in your senses at the time and you've come round to your senses, you are not responsible for that act. Obviously, if you're doing something volition, if you're repeatedly uh, getting drunk or doing something else which is putting you in that situation, there's a different situation there. So that may be why in this country, you don't often hear of people using the insanity defense. Usually their lawyers will just try and get a diminished capacity, uh, a lesser sentence, but still pleading guilty to the crime, which is not strictly correct, but it's because of the way in which sentencing happens. Uh, in this country. So sometimes we get confused about what is and what is not insanity and when somebody is and is not responsible and how we should and should not face that act and face uh, that difficulty. Now I know that I may have confused more than I've answered questions. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there because I often find that the questions that I have are illuminating not only for the audience, but even to me to show me what I have said which was not clear, what I should have said but did not say, and what I said which was a mistake. And for all that is good, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for where I make mistakes, I ask for your forgiveness. And I invite your questions, inshallah. <laughs>